Good afternoon. Um, this is our session. We're going to talk about virtual production. Now, we'll talk about who we've got on the panel here in a second, but um, I think the thing to say first is that this is not going to be a technical discussion. This is going to be a discussion about concepts because there's a lot of people who are a bit concerned. Maybe they've got a show coming up that's going to use virtual production. They'd like to use it. But it seems very technical, and it can be. Um, but the idea here is to get to a position where if it looks right on the monitor, it is right. And I think the idea of this is to get people into a position where that can be the case most of the time. Um, we've only got half an hour, so we're going to move quite quickly. Um, I ask the panel to introduce themselves. We'll start from Stacey down the other end. Hi, I'm Stacia. I'm a virtual production producer. I've worked with Lux Machina and Dimension DNEG, and I'm currently working with Dark Matters in France. Uh, hi, I'm Will Case from uh, Creative Technology. Um, I'm director of innovation there. Uh, we build and run the studio with ARI, uh, the ARI stage in London. We've done that for the last two and a half years now. Um, we've run some. I think we've done 27 productions in there now. <coughs> the last um, my name is James Nickcroft, Director of Photography. Um, originally from the entertainment and VFX industry, lots of the work I currently do and have done in the past combines new and emerging technologies of filmmaking and lots of virtual production in the last two years. Hi, my name is Colin Nicell. I work for ARI, the Global Solutions Group, which take care also of our VP stage in Uxbridge. Uh, my background is technical, being a lighting cameraman for the last 20 years. Um, and now I'm on the more VP business side with ARI. And I'm Dale Elena McCready. I'm a DOP. Um, I shoot mostly scripted drama, televisual drama, and have always ended up with a bit of VFX background in that shooting, and more recently doing a bit of virtual production. Um, in a show for Sky called The Rising and then also testing the ARI stage out over a two-week two period for Sky um, a year or so ago. Okay, so I'm going to suggest that the um, we're going to talk for about half an hour. It doesn't seem like there'll be uh, much of a choice, a chance to have questions because we're quite pushed for time, but it might be possible for us to move outside afterwards and maybe have a chat. Um, the first thing I'm going to suggest we talk about is that this issue of not wanting to get too technical because virtual production facilities are built out of a stack of technology. Um, large amounts of technology which was not necessarily intended specifically or even solely to be used for virtual production. So who is there someone here who wants to dive in on that and give us an idea of what the technology is and uh, ideally I suppose the the situation is that the stage crew should be responsible for dealing with that and a director of photography should not have to deal with that. Yeah, I mean, is it worth me just quickly starting that? I mean, no. I think what we've seen as a, a journey here is, is that the technology can get, away, get in the way of some of the crazy that needs to happen. And I think you can drown in the technology and it is evolving and changing the whole time. So actually, I think it's, we're a period now where we've got real stability. It's a big leap on from where we were two years ago. And I think it's really now about what you do with it, and I think it's all about what it is as a creative tool within that toolkit that you have and how you use that and how production wants to use that. I think if you start getting too deep dive into technology, what LED is, what processor is using, what tracking system you're using, you're just going to end up in a, in a chasing your tail around and around and around, when actually it's what you do with it, and it's all about the output that you're going to get from that. Yeah. Yeah, I, one of the things that keeps coming up is that the specifics of that, if you are a part of a camera department, the specifics of how a stage works will be somebody else's problem. Is that fair to say? Hopefully. Oh, hopefully. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, that, I think that's certainly the case. I mean, this, this industry, this kind of technique is born out of the um, kind of confluence of video games, entertainment and film. And obviously all the politics and the, um, all of those different departments have different kind of ways of working and uh, the early days of virtual production it was very much undecided of where the boundaries of those different roles um, stopped and if in the last year it's really matured I think into a kind of far more set delineated workflow on set mm -hmm. and um, really to allow director of photography the creatives do their thing and keep um, the technical side to a different department. Yeah, it can be quite intimidating having a you know, table this long with people with computers on it behind you working on the screens for you. But quite quickly you work out that you and your gaffer can say, can you give me a flag over here? And it's boop, over the top of you, knocking off a bit of the light on someone's head, 
and it can be very, very fast, and you suddenly go, wow, okay, this is actually really interesting. I'm starting to do lighting again by moving things around, but these people are able to give me those tools. And so the initial scary thing is getting smoother and moving ahead so rapidly that it's, um, you, you quite quickly get back to shooting again and just operating and making things look as real as you can. Yeah, and I think that idea of you getting bogged down as Will says in the technology, what drives it, things like that, that can take away from the creativity really. And I think if you concentrate too much on that, that's not really what you want to be concentrating your energy on. So for us, if you come and shoot in the REVB stage, we like to get involved right in the pre-production. We'll give you all the advice you need, anything like that, because it's smoother for us or for you when you show up in the day, it's smoother for you as well. So it's in our interest to do that. I think we're also um, entering kind of a second wave of virtual production where the teams that have been on these stages have been there for a while now. They've established workflows and they're very confident in how they can translate your vision. So there is certainly um, a, a opportunity for um, learning in between the camera department and the onset VP teams. And absolutely, it's important to take advantage of that when you come onto the set and schedule time for your departments to integrate so that it, it, you kind of um, can put a face to it so it's a bit less scary something going on behind a, a black curtain in the corner over there. I think that's kind of like a series of standards, uh, standardizations which is I think the responsibility for standardization comes from the studio really and every studio every studio is different so there's going to be a slightly different standardization for every studio and if you're coming to do a virtual production stage I really feel every time I shoot at the ARI stage, it's, the ARI, it's ARI's responsibility and role to say this is how, yeah. if you want, this is how yeah. you should shoot. To you get should the be best filming as a, a DP, yeah. you come yeah. in and you shoot, and that's mm. our responsibility mm. is to make sure that you're ready to shoot. Mm. If you're coming in and you're in our space and we're fiddling and making things right and mm. working, we're, we're in the wrong, something's going wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And sl slowly and surely the standardizations and the language, I think, I think one thing is, is no one knew the terminologies between the different departments. And now it's become a far more known aspect. You know, everyone knows what a frostrum is, and everyone yeah. knows what I had the not brain but frostrum exactly. until I stepped exactly. on the stage. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'd heard nothing else. But it's like become <laughs> it's be that has become more ubiquitous now as language. So it's really is, is it worth saying that um, much as there's this huge stack of technology involved? it's probably unlikely that things are going to become universally standardized across all virtual production stages because in some ways we need that modularity for the flexibility of it. As you were saying, you, you, know, you want a flag, a flag appears. And how that is, the specifics of how that is done will vary depending on you know, a large number of variables. So it, Yeah, I mean, know. it would have to be modular because I think that's what shooting is. Yeah. Shooting is modular, like this is a good example. Some shots are going to be handheld, some are going to be on a dolly. Mm -hmm. That has different limitations mm -hmm. with the equipment um, and the tracking and things as well. Um, so there's always going to be those changes. But I think the, that modularity is going to remain, but I think the standardization of like, uh, this is what the camera sees, so the screen gives it what it can see the most of coming out of the machines is, is going to get better and better. Yeah, yeah we can hope that um, all the big players in the industry will, over the coming year even, um, get together to work on a set of guidelines for the industry. I think we, we, these conversations are happening and things like colour pipeline can be agreed on. Um, we should all be working in the same colour space. These are some conversations that, that we can yeah. have as an industry to uh, create standardisation. Also. Second point to that, the um, virtual production to post or virtual production to VFX pipeline can also be standardized. Yeah, okay. Um, the, I suppose the other thing to say about demystifying and making things a bit less scary is that no one's objected to this before, so if anyone hates what I'm about to say, just throw things at me. But this is really just evolved back projection, and we've been doing back projection since 1930-something. It became possible to do that when it became possible to synchronize projectors for sound purposes, so it came out of sound technology. It's that old. And you go up through 2001, Aliens, and then they started using video uh, wall segments for lighting on things like um, Tron Legacy, and then you have all the front projection for Oblivion. This is not, this should not be wildly new, I think. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Also, I would add to it that when we talk about virtual production, it's very easy to get bogged down in a fully 3D environment and unreal. Mm. And some of the best use cases I've come across so far have actually been using it as reprojection because the screens are so fantastic and the ambient light is so good. 
They're doing someone, um, we did a motorcycle rider riding down the road in the daytime and at night and car material. And just that the replacement of a projection screen with a virtual, with a LED screen is just such a game changer for poor man's process as well that it's worth thinking about that as a, it's a lot simpler to run as well. So it's a really nice use case of the, particularly the ARI stage as well. But that's a really good example of why it doesn't really matter. That's just one of the greatest shots I think we did in the last two years, I think that, because, and I know, you know, we were there with Dell when, when she did it, is that when they started, they couldn't do that shot because that was a shot that was impossible. But actually by playing and being in the studio and being there, suddenly they found you can get a camera into the eyes of somebody on a motorbike doing 80 kilometers an hour down a dirt track and just pulled off this incredible shot where they came out of it. Now, <coughs> it didn't really matter whether it was a plate, as in a 2D plate shot, or a 3D. It was the creative output that allowed Dale to go in there and, and get that shot that she wouldn't have been able to do any other way. Yeah. And, and, it, and hadn't been available to you to do that shot. And it allowed our actor to be in the scene yeah. instead of a stunt person or somebody else or cheating it. It was actually our actor riding the motocross bike on a track in a race with other people around her. And so it was safer and better yeah. that way. But There's a sh great short film out there somewhere that was shot by Marcus Forderer. And uh, it was done way back at the beginning of um, the sort of interest in those two or three years ago when things were still sort of fairly nascent. And they simply had a 20 foot wide chunk of video wall on, on wheels and they rolled it around the background of the shot and put some stuff they shot on a drone. They were in a helicopter, so they shot it off a drone. Great, and fine. Before that's these big screens, I was tempted to get a 60 inch TV and just yeah. put it next to a car. You know. That's, that's <laughs> fine, you can totally do that, that will work. You're, you're referring back to the time you know, of rear projection and stuff. And for me, I always think of this, it's a tradition, it's such an old technique, yeah. but just, it's a matte painting, but the matte painting moves nowadays. So all of the old, technologies and ways of thinking from a hundred years ago for lighting a matte painting or a, a rear projection. Yeah, and, and adding to that as well, the, the same problems that you do have in rear projection, which is the, the blacks being lifted by the ambient light, mm. still do happen to a degree on virtual stages. And th these things are improving all the time as well, but um, that's you know the same techniques that you might have used when you're doing a, a film screen um, still apply. Yeah, that's something that keeps coming up. Is that you know, they make the LED with video wall as black as they can, but a fairly large proportion of it is still tiny, shiny little LEDs. So you tend to. But it goes to it goes to the the biggest bugbear I have. I think often seeing virtual production move forward is about art direction. Yeah. Is that there is a massive you you because of the technology, there has been a real lack of art direction often in in the way that content is shot, and actually that's because the the pipeline has been pushed, especially down the 3D pipeline, down one route. And actually, what I think is really interesting now is that we're now open that back out to the VFX community to start bringing back in all that traditional art direction, all the techniques they've been using for years and years and years to build backplates. It doesn't have to be full 3D real-time rendered content. It can be 2.5D. It can be 2D's created beautiful backgrounds. It does not have to be full 3D backgrounds as, as, as the way it is. And I think that's something that I think people have forgotten a little bit about. And actually, everything we do in filmmaking is art directed. And the challenge with real time is it's often not real. That you're trying to create reality and then shoot it. And actually, some of that art direction sometimes is missing a bit. And in order to enable that type of um, workflow between different departments, it's really important that everyone's onboarded early, that you have different departments on calls early in pre production, early in creative development, and you have all your key HODs on these calls signing off and agreeing on these processes so you can move forward. Mm -hmm. And from our point of view, it's important for that to be communicated to us be like before you start using our facility. We're there to help the process even be like better. So as much information as we can have before you come into our studio and shoot, it's going to benefit both. You know, we're not just there as someone you rock up coldly and we'll shoot it on the day and that's it. We're there throughout the whole process as, as a VP stage. So it's, uh, it's beneficial for both sides as well. Collaborate. It's um, important yeah. to remember that this has to begin a bit earlier than, than you're used to. If you've never shot VP before, I think that's one of the biggest um, uh, re repeated kind of issues that we see for new production companies coming in is they expect um, the speed of their pre-production to be the same as it usually would be. But um, really what you're doing is you're taking a big chunk of your post work and you're bringing that into your pre-production phase. So you just have to plan for that, have to be prepared for it. I yeah. think, um, and adding to that again, is that producers might have to get slightly used to that. We, on the Rising, where we did a bunch of ma car material and motorcycle material, 
it did take a number of days the week leading up to our shoot to get that all ready and then we shot six scenes I think in that day and so there's a bit more a bit more of a spend earlier on but actually we managed to shoot a lot more material that we wouldn't have got otherwise necessarily. The note I've got here says that uh, you know most of the VFX work that would have been done in post now has to be get done in pre-production yeah. and of course that means two things number it ch changes the timing mm. but it also means that you have this absolutely immovable cast iron deadline which means that that has to be it's not it's not more work it should ideally be slightly less work, but it's just done at a different time, and I think I that's, that's the always, important part. I'd always compare it to theatre, and we on Air Force, I always say, the time when you turn over on a VP stage, that's when the curtain goes up on your, on your, um, your shoot, you know, on your theatre production. So dress rehearsals, costume department, all of that has been planned weeks in advance, and all the DPs doing on a, all the DPs doing on a virtual production team is shooting the live show. Yeah, it is in camera. We did a, uh, a setup with a, the Earth spinning and, a, and an astronaut in orbit about to come plummeting to his death. And um, that was using anamorphic lenses and had a lot of flaring and we had the sunlight flaring the lens. And you can do that on these screens because you're not doing a key. It's not a green screen that has to be done later. It's not an overlay. And in the end, all that had to be done to the shot to tidy it up was a bit of wire removal and uh, a color grade. This is one of the, the last notes I had on this, but it's worth bringing up now, is the idea, people say, what's the post-process of a virtual production? And ideally, none. I mean, sh this is the advantage of it, is you just shoot, but you have to prep for that shoot. Yeah, and in order to be able to prep for that, um, there's this idea, w which is true in virtual production, that you can just sort of turn up and everything is flexible, everything is changeable. You can grab this tree, you can move it over there, you can change you know, your light source, you can do anything. Yes, but should you? This is mm -hmm. something yeah. uh, that comes up quite often. You have all of these capabilities, but when is the right time to exercise that creative flexibility? Ideally, this is all happening and signed off well before you get to shoot. So you can show up after your pre-light, you know every shot you're going to get that day, and everyone's in agreement about that yeah. schedule. But that's all about, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, I think one of the things that often gets left out of this conversation is cameras. Yeah. It's all about what happens in camera. I mean, you can see the size of the stage here. You're only shooting into one part of that. So you can get really carried away with everything else around it, but actually it's what's happening in camera every single time. And you can get really sidetracked by what's going on outside of the screens. And I think, you know, the camera color workflow and everything is, is probably one of the most important parts of it. To yeah. get that right, because if you haven't got the colour workflow right, you haven't got your blacks and whites balanced, you're you're not going to get anything out of the back of it that is going to be useful. Yeah, it's, an, it's an illusion that we have to create, and every part of that illusion has to work <laughs> yeah. consecutively. And also, like you say, that's so important. I think colour management, the colour workflow, like Ari have developed, for example, their VP stage is going to save you time in post production, trying to balance your foreground subject, who's you know who's actually there, and your background, which should be your LED. So, I mean, that's so important and sometimes gets left on the back burner. Um, but I think like it's, that's, that's gonna save you so much time in your post that ordinarily you would have done trying to color match foreground and background. Is it worth saying that, and I know this is a slightly controversial thing and we talked about this when we were prepping all this, almost all of the time when you are approaching a virtual production stage with say a camera that hasn't been on that stage before with lenses that haven't been on that stage, there is probably going to be a brief but necessary period of kind of trimming things in yeah. inevitably. Yeah, I mean, as much as we'd all love it as humans, there's no copy paste yeah. in, in VP at the moment. There is a baseline, but you do have to test. And especially if you're coming into our stage, you're using our cameras, our lighting. Yes, we've done all that. That's, we don't need to test that. We've done all that R&D. That's what the stage is there for also. But if you're coming in with different kits, you do have to set aside that time do your own testing to make sure you're getting the look that you want. And in terms of that look, what you're expecting from your LED wall is uh, as neutral of a color space as possible. That's not really where you want to make your creative choices. And I think sometimes there can be a conception that, again, just because you can, should you, all of these creative color choices should ideally be done in the camera. Yeah, yeah. You can't wing it on a VP stage, put it that way. Do your pre-production <laughs> well. Because it will save you time. It's expensive. Yeah, exactly. It's expensive. We're gonna. <laughs> but this is something that you can also relate back again to, um, just back projection. You know, on Aliens over at Pinewood, they had the model unit working on the stage next to the main unit, and they had far fewer controls to mess around with what the background looked like. So again, this is not scary or new, and this shouldn't 
scare well, anyone off. As an example, I found quite quickly that because the black levels of the background can be different to your foreground, that a traditional thing like a, a camera flasher, like a map box that is actually pushing some light into the camera and lifting the blacks, which is something that's been around for a long time but not really in use that much more recently, works really well. So an LED light pointing into a diffusion filter and then some cling film on the, on the diffusion filter <laughs> can actually make the blacks sit together, even if they're brighter, and then you can grade them back, back down together. So there's this, like, there are some in-camera weird tricks that you can do too that actually are like traditional shooting. But we we, we talk saying, sorry, just, so I'm just following that. I, I think it's also worth saying in, is that the very hard thing about standardizing things is that um, I think I said we've done 27 productions. Probably that's 20 different D DOPs we've worked with. I think. Yeah. Not all. Of every them single <laughs> every every single one of them is different. Yeah. There no two DOPs are the same. They don't work the same way. They have different ways they want to deal with it. The way they do their lighting, the way they want to use the wall. Some people use it in a full digital setup. They don't use it. You know, others want to use lighting. It, it, there is there, there's certain. That's why the it is to your point about how the studio should set it to be the, the starting building block, and then you come into that space, and then you build your production around how you want it to work for the way you want to shoot. No one shoots the same way. Oh. I mean, it's worth talking about what you're talking about with um, optical filtration, that kind of thing. I mean, one of the things about people like using old lenses, which are interesting, and you don't, oh, sometimes you might not want to do that on a green screen, and virtual production, Most you're fine. <laughs> um, so, you, you know, again, the idea is you just shoot. Um, we should talk a bit about lighting because we, we plan to do so. Um, and you talk about keeping light off the screen and it's not quite as sensitive to that as this projection screen behind us is. Uh, what do we think about um, I interactive? I mean, they have, there's the color quality problem of the screen light and then there's the, um, so you want to reinforce it with conventional production lighting. But then there's um, image-based lighting and you know arrays of quasar pixel tubes and all that kind of stuff. What, what, what do we think about that? Uh, well, the image-based lighting is fantastic. I think I found that interactive lights that need to be throwing a shadow that moves and have some sort of cast to them, like an actual shadow um, from an actor, need to be real lights. And similarly, the sun, if you're looking for a hard light. But um, everything else was really great to use as image-based lighting, especially on the area stage where you can bring the side panels in and to different distances and brightnesses. And, and use the, the video as your, or your media as your light source. Um, that ambience is fantastic. And a good example of that is being able to shoot a sunset scene, a la Mandalorian and things, where you could shoot all day at sunset mm. because yeah. the light does match and it's wrapping all around the person in a, in a beautiful way. I think early on in VP there was a kind of myth that lighting wasn't needed. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Like fixtures weren't yeah. needed and LED walls don't project hard hard shapes, yeah. hard sources. So you do, and I, I always find, I, I'll use the wall for ambience. So obviously background in camera and the ambience, but to do any kind of shaping and modeling and to carry that light from the content onto your character. Yeah, much less light though. You do need yeah, a little, just yeah. The quality of light needs to still be there actually yeah. onto the person. But yeah, we, for example, we most of the time used to use one orbiter as mm. a sun mm -hmm. and it worked really well. Is it safe to say that we don't want to rely on the screen as our key light to the lead talent? Is that perhaps in the first? Depends point? if you want a soft light or a hard light. Yeah, <laughs> I'm thinking about color quality. No, the color's know. very good actually. Mm. Yeah. Depends on the screen. Yeah. yeah. Depends on so it depends on the screen and depends on the scene. I think yeah, and what you're what you're trying to end up with as well. Yeah. 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 Okay. Now this is the point at which I put down to talk about post, but we've talked about post. I mean, you've mentioned that there sometimes was some sort of minor colour trimming to do, but matching black levels, that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, you're still shooting on a, essentially a log camera most of the time, or a raw shooting camera, so you're still doing a co your colour grade as normal. Mm. So some tweaks like that are always going to be there, I think. And, and I don't think that really changes, that, that post side of your normal finishing as a DP, doing colour is still the same. You just happen to have capture the background and the foreground at the same time in camera. Okay, um, we're getting to the, towards the point where we have to start wrapping this up, but I, I, I suppose there's a couple of sort of more general things that we've talked about. Um, people have this impression that virtual production is going to make everything really, really cheap, and at the end of the day, the facilities are not inexpensive things. Um, so is it perhaps accurate to say that it won't make modestly expensive things really cheap, but it might make really, really expensive things quite a lot cheaper than they would otherwise have been. Is that the fair way to put it? Yes, I, yeah. and also there's um, 
more than one method of working in virtual production, it doesn't mean you need to use a fully three-dimensional world. You can still use plates, you can still use projection, so sometimes working with, say, a very small screen on a 2D plate is going to do the job. So mm. it's very important, I think, while you're planning to consider what you actually need to get the job done rather than getting carried away and excited by what's available. Yeah, and mm. some, some shots you can't get because you can't put your actor in that situation or it's too uh, expensive to schedule. Um, those, there are certain situations where it's the right tool and it is going to save you money, even if it's expensive, because you just may not have been able to even do it. Mm. You know, people talk about, you know, if you've got some expen expensive actor that you want, you've only got for a certain number of days, then it's really worth, worth you know, because you don't have to travel. Um, I suppose that we'll just return at the end here to something we said at the beginning, which is the idea is that you should just be able to just, once it's set up, you should be able to just shoot and not be too concerned. <coughs> Are there any circumstances where you could look at it and say, if it looks right, it is right. Is that ever wrong? And if it looks right, it should be right. Yeah, well, that's, that's the idea. Yeah? As you're capturing it in camera, yeah. 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 Which makes it really easy. <laughs> <laughs> should do. Oh. <laughs> okay, I think maybe we've got 30 seconds left. Anything else anyone wants to say? No, I think that's... No, I just, the word we always use in, in virtual product is just collaboration. Yeah. You just have to collaborate. You, you cannot work as an island. You, it's, that's why it's very different and that's why I think some people are struggling with it a little bit because they're not used to working that way uh, but it is essential that everybody works together and it means that the technologists have to be further up the chain to talk about to help with the DOP to help with the it, it's, it's just I mean I actually love it I, I think it's a great way to work and, it, and it's, it's, it's really yeah. enlightening and enjoyable but and, and we're all at the beginning of this process as well yeah. like we're up here on this panel but we've maybe done a bit more than other people there are no experts. No one's done no. <laughs> lots and lots of it. No. I think in the end, it, it, people talk about the fact that you've got to be, have, have all these things happening in pre-production or perhaps during production when you're preparing to do this. You've got all of your creative buddies there with you, rather than this sort of divide between production and post, which sometimes causes tension when you've got, you know, someone's thrown a green screen back there, oh, what's going there, we don't know, we'll think about it later. Having all these people working together in pre-production, that's not bad, that's good, that's nice, that's fun, that's, that's a plus. So I think that's... Uh, Good place to end it. Yep. Cool.